You know what we're going to talk about today? Ears to hear. This is, um, uh, has to do and is connected with part of the mystery, if you would, of the kingdom. Jesus Christ is the only one in Scripture, in the New Testament uh, as an example, that used this statement, and he used it seven times when he was still in the flesh, walking the earth, and he would use it eight times after the crucifixion, that is to say in teaching in the book of Revelation primarily. And uh, each time he said it, he was talking to a special group of people and naturally people that had ears to hear. And that's why he would caution. So, in making a study of these seven times, and naturally seven is spiritual completeness and eight is new beginnings in numerics, uh, or whatever that might have to do with it. And I feel in a sense from the manuscripts that it is even hidden an eighth time, and I'll mention that at the completion of this, the following lecture, uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. It was always, we're going to take the seven times it was utilized by Christ when he walked in the flesh, and see if you can ascertain the truth or the hidden element that he wanted you to have eyes to see. Naturally, he wanted you to have eyes to see with understanding his word. But there is a key. And the first time it was mentioned, we find it in Luke chapter 8. And we'll pick up the parable. It has to do with the parable of the sower. And it is something you must understand. The parable of the sower, chapter 8, the book of Luke, verse 5. Let's go with it. This would be the first occasion. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down. And the fowls of the air devoured it. And of course, this is the devil. The Satan himself will, if you um, don't take root, or root into the Word of God, you're real easily led off into the ways of the world, all right? Verse 6, And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, in other words, the seed germinated, it withered away because it lacked moisture, had no depth. And that's the way some people are with the Word. Incidentally, this sowing is the Word of God. And if you'll picture uh, in, from the old times when a man carried a seed bag by his side and he broadcast like this. And one man can, and many of us in rural areas have done this many times, even for lawns or pastures, you could easily cover a 30-foot swath uh, by sowing in this manner. All right, verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. All of you are familiar with the parable of the sower, so I'm not going to go into great depth on the meaning of sowing the word because there's a deeper truth we want, and we're going to find it. Verse 8, And other fell on good ground and sprang up. In other words, it, it hit uh, prepared soil or a prepared mine and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried. Not spoke, but with a loud voice. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. With understanding, of course. I think it's amazing. What did the disciples say? Verse 9, and his disciples asked, saying, What might this parable be? They didn't understand. Verse 10, and he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries. I repeat, mysteries of the kingdom of God but to the others in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. In other words, those without ears to hear, they're not going to hear. So that deep mystery is hidden in the parables. We're going to dig it out so that you see and understand. That was the first time. And again, he would do this seven times. Let's move on, if we may, to Matthew chapter 11. I want to... This would be the second time that he uttered this. We're going to do them in chronological order 
though it would be a little more work that way, but it's good for you to have them in chronological order as he used them. Chapter 11 in the book of Matthew, pick it up with verse 7. And as they departed Jerusalem, began to, uh, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John. Now, this is to the multitudes. Now remember, John had sent two uh, disciples, that's to say his disciples, to ask if this was the Christ and this was the advent in which the kingdom would come into being. And he's referring to John, John the Baptist. What went ye out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in with the wind? In other words, a man that can be bent this way and a man that can be bent that way, a man that will hear this and go with it and then somebody else? Verse 8. But what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Remember, John wore a prophet's garb. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Verse 9. But what went you out to, for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, prophet uh, John the Baptist was the last line of prophets before Christ. I want to say that again. John the Baptist was the last of the old prophets, that is to say in a line of prophets, up until the time of the appearance of, of uh, Messiah. And naturally, he was that prophet that would foretell of Messiah's coming. He wasn't one that would listen to this man or that man. He was straight on, yea or nay. He knew the word of God. He was led of God. He was gifted of God, naturally, because through his birth, one that was even named by God himself. Verse 10, For this is he, this John, this is he, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And of course this quotes from Malachi chapter 3, 1, and also the last, uh, the fourth chapter of Malachi, and it's talking about Elijah the coming of Elijah. And as it is written in Luke chapter 1, what is it, verse 16, that John was not Elijah, but that John came in the spirit of Elijah. Okay, verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That is to say, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, and naturally those that overcome are above flesh. Verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The forceful ones take it. Now, the war was in heaven. You've read of the war, the great war in heaven in Daniel chapter 10. Satan is, as we know, makes a pilgrimage before God, as it is written in Job chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, not unusual. And uh, there is still that war. God allows, I repeat, allows Satan's evil spirit and spirits, plural, uh, be the forceful ones that is the prince of the air. If you listen to them, they'll take you down Primrose Lane, all right? Verse 13, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, you see, that there's a big word there, if, if you will receive it, this is Elias, which is the, Greek form for Elijah. This is Elijah which was for to come. And then verse 15, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, there is a dispensational uh, truth within this that um, if you lock in on it, they didn't receive John the Baptist. Neither They beheaded him and they crucified Messiah if they had received him, if, the, if all peoples had turned to the truth of God's word at that time, 
then the first advent would have been sufficient. That would have been it. We would have gone into the millennium age. Did our father know that's how it would be? Of course, I feel he did. Why? He knows his children. And the whole purpose of this earth age is to save those children that will love our father rather than following the forceful ones, which is to say the evil one, which is to say Satan. So there you have the second time, ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear? Many of you have known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you had been taught, and you like to seek it out for yourself, and that is good. That is good. If you spend your entire life searching the mysteries of God's kingdom, then you will be a citizen of that kingdom. I want to, I want to follow that thought. Go to the 17th chapter. Of uh, Many find that a little bit confusing concerning John the Baptist uh, being Elias. I want to add somewhat to that. This will not be the third time that that is used, but I wish to come here not to digress, but to nail that point home. In the seventh verse of the 17th chapter of Matthew, um, I'm sorry, in the 10th verse of the 17th chapter, let's pick it up there. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come, that Elijah must come first? And, and of course, it is written that Elijah would come first and turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural, meaning our heavenly father, and some to the, the truth will drive to Satan, the fake father, okay? Verse 11, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah, I'm going to say it in the Hebrew, truly shall first come and restore all things. Now, has that happened? Have all things been restored? Of course they haven't. But they're going to be as far as truth is concerned. Verse 11. In other words, we're talking about the second advent now, not the first. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah, I'm sorry, we, um, Elijah uh, truly shall come first and restore all things. 12. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. And, and then uh, in verse 13, then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. That he was not, things were not restored. Things were not in place. And uh, they did with him as they chose. And, of course, that would be their downfall. Now, so, so John the Baptist, though he was the last of the old prophets, he was not a reed shaken in the wind. He was a man of God, very bold and declaring the word of God, a vessel that God used to, to prepare the way for the first advent. Part of the dispensationalism within the mystery of the kingdom. All right, now the, um, the third time that the statement, ears to hear, was utilized, you'll find in the 13th uh, chapter of Matthew, you'll also find the 14th time here. <clears throat> now, this indeed is the parable of the sower. Probably amplified here better than anywhere in the Word of God. And Jesus, in the beginning of this 13th chapter, um, gives that parable. We're, we're going to cover it. Let's go with verse 3. And uh, this, this will be the third time. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. For, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Uh, same story. Why? Because there's only one truth. And again, related to planting seeds, which is to say the word of God. Verse 5, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. 
6, and when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away, naturally. Verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And then we go to verse 8, But other fell into good ground. In other words, the word of God does hit fertile soil occasionally and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. God uses people as they are able to be utilized. And then comes that statement. Listen carefully. Verse 9, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And again, the statement. And I cannot help going on to get the follow-up. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Same answer, 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. You see, the parable of the sower leads up to the sowing of the tares, which goes back to the very foundation of this particular earth age and what happened there. Um, I'm... You, you, if you're not familiar with it, and I, I know if you've studied with me for a while, you're familiar with it because in the Mark of the Beast we go into this in much detail. And because of that, because of knowing that you are um, well acquainted with the parable of the, the sower, and as it is written in the book of Luke, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of his parables. What does that mean? Well, you probably don't have eyes to see. But in the simplicity in which he teaches it, he begins in the parable of the tares, which um, there was a, a plant. It, was, it is called zewan uh, in the Hebrew tongue. It looks exactly like wheat when it is growing. And it will grow among wheat. You can't tell the difference, really until the seed is produced, that's to say the fruit. And the Zawan are children that the wicked one planted in the beginning. Where? In the garden. This is part of that mystery, and if you're not familiar with it, you're not totally going to understand any of Christ's parables. That's why you with ears to hear must understand with clarity that that Christ taught. So, for the sake of time, we're going to go to Christ's definition. Not when he is giving a parable, but when he is explaining one and allow him, allow him to explain it to you rather than man. Now, we're going to skip to the 34th verse, and again, this will be the fourth time the fourth time that this ears to hear is mentioned when Christ walked in the flesh. Making it the fourth, then you must understand from verse 34 uh, through uh, verse 43. I want to cover it very carefully. Bear in mind what was just said, as you will find the wicked one that sowed the tares uh, from verse 24 up to this time. You can cover it if you're not familiar with it. We're going to begin with verse 34. And these, uh, bear in mind, he had just given the parable of the leaven, meaning if a little bit of truth can come into your mind, just as when you put just a little bit of yeast or leaven in the dough, that leaven goes totally through the dough and ferments it so does real truth in your mind if you have ears to hear the seed that must germinate and must sprout in your mind spiritually for you to understand the parables and the mystery of the kingdom that is entailed and written in the Word of God. Okay, so verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. In other words, not to the disciples, meaning his students, but to the multitude. And without a parable spake he not unto them. He just didn't. Verse 35, that it might be fulfilled. This is fulfilling prophecy within itself. 
which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. This is Psalm 78, all right, verse 2. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, this word foundation is where the Greek verb katabu, uh, um, which is to say the overthrow of Satan. All right? Uh, and um, it's been kept secret since that time. Why? When Satan rebelled. And, um, and uh, overthrew, those of you with Companion Bibles, Appendix 146 will, will catch you up to speed on that particular subject. Continuing, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. Understand, the multitude is gone. And he went into the house and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. But they just couldn't get it. So here we are. We are pre present. We have the teacher, Christ. And we have the disciples. And we do not have present anyone that should not have ears to hear. Therefore, he's going to explain. They've asked. Listen to it. See if you can understand. Verse 37. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, that is Christ the Savior in flesh, the only begotten Son of God. He's the one, the Spirit that moved upon the waters, the Spirit that moved upon the heavens, the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, that when God spoke, nothing became everything. Allow me, verse 38. The field, now what is this field they were sowing in? Listen, this is really deep, all right? The field is the world. Isn't that simple? The field where the wicked seed was sown and, and the good seed was the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. They're God's children. But the tares, this is a one are the children of the wicked one. Who is the wicked one? It's Satan, of course. So the, the man that, slept, that slipped into the field, the world, and sowed the bad seed was Satan himself. I don't know how Christ could, could uh, make it any clearer. And those of you that might be doubting Thomas's, I would advise you to break this word seed, uh, sperma, back into the Greek. And then maybe it would clear up for you. Verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Now isn't that complicated? You would think anyone would have ears that they could hear that. It's such a simple teaching. And it is Christ that's doing the teaching. The harvest is the end of the world. That's to say this world age and the reapers are the angels. That's why he would tell them in the parable back beginning with verse 24 up to the 34th verse that uh, the Zawan should be left alone. You start trying, they look so much like wheat that if you start rooting them out, you'll, you'll damage some of the wheat. And those of you that, that know and understand this mystery know that some of the wheat cannot stand the truth, so you leave the Zawan alone. You leave the tares alone, but you certainly know their work, and you certainly can see it, and you're aware of it. In other words, who was the enemy seed? It was Cain, of course, the first murderer. Christ would make it very clear in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, that the first murderer in the beginning was a child of the devil. You are of your father the devil. He makes that very clear. The first murderer, Cain, that's when it started. Isn't that complicated? Isn't that deep? But the traditions of men will prohibit the ears of most people hearing that because the traditions of men make void the simplicity in which Christ teaches. It would all be spiritualized away even with the word seed sperma 
in the Greek being male sperm. They'll still throw it out the window. Verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Everything, everyone's deeds are as tested by fire. If your deeds are the equivalent of gold, you won't be hurt. But if your deeds are evil, such as that of the tares, then, I'm sorry, the lake of fire will be your resting place. That's the way it is. Verse, but the angels, why? We will be in the millennium at this time. Even the tares, as it is written, uh, in another place that this great saying, ears to hear, was, would be stated, and this is to say after the crucifixion, stipulates that even they will come and worship at your feet because you're at the feet of Christ. Verse 41, The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, those that sin, they're going to be gathered out. That's why you don't have to worry about it. Um, that is not to say that you are not to practice discernment and with intelligence do that that God has told you to do, but you don't go around trying to destroy tares. Verse 42, And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then with verse 43, which brings us to the fourth time that Jesus would utilize this saying, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. They're where? They're in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, do you? Let him hear. Can you hear the word of God? I don't know how Christ could have made it any simpler that this secret concerning Cain's genealogy, and it's amazing that he makes it so simple that when you go back to Genesis chapter 4, you find Cain's genealogy. And then in the last two verses of that fourth chapter, he begins the genealogy of Adam. You find Cain in Adam's genealogy? Absolutely not. Cain has no part in Adam's genealogy. Why? Because he was not of Adam. He was of that wicked one. Again, that's a very hard teaching for many to understand. But it is a pure, simple truth. As forestated, seeds of truth, as they fall into the minds of people, many of them will fall, and there will be some pretty good soil. They'll say, hey, I can see that. That really sounds great. But it's very shallow. Rather than check this out for myself, I'm going to go ask brother so-and-so. He's an expert. And you always want to remember what an expert is, all right? Now, sometimes the definition is not too good, but be that as it may, I'm not going to digress here. And the dear brother is going to say, why would you ever, ever think such a thing as that? When God sent the Son to save all of the world, and you're only to think positive and never anything negative such as a people or a seed tares that might have been planted on this earth. Uh, you're going to have to put that out of your mind. Well then, if you listen to the, that brother instead of Jesus Christ, my friend, hey, have a good trip. Welcome to the fire. It's going to get real hot for you. Because if you listen to the traditions of men and the good brothers that are biblically illiterate, that do not have eyes to see or ears to hear, have a good trip, all right? The millennium will be a very interesting time, a very interesting time. Christ could not have made it any plainer. Now, there will be people that that truth, ears to hear, 
will fall into their minds and it will find fertile ground. And they will be able to see, presto, the overall picture and plan of God for salvation. Why that we're on this earth age. And that seed will grow and they will study God's commandments and not only will they study, they will do them. They will serve, they will begin broadcasting themselves that seed of truth and it will grow until a little bit of leaven leavens the whole loaf. And that's what a servant of God does. Sometimes it's received joyfully and sometimes it's received with great difficulty and even hard feelings. But that's okay. Never let that deter you. And why do I say that? I say that for those that possibly the seed fell on fertile soil, a little shallow, then put some depth. By that, do as Jeremiah would say, follow your ground, plow it deep, get it in shape for the planting. Get it in shape, your mind, to receive the Word of God, as taught in truth by Jesus Christ. So, so far, we've got three more to go, and we'll be covering some of those even in the eighth, and we'll get to those in the last part of this uh, particular subject. Ears to hear, fascinating, fascinating. How could that be that in the garden, the wicked one sl slipped in and planted seed. But then is it not written in chapter 3, verse 16, that after the serpent seduced Eve, beguiled her, expatio in the Greek, wholly seduced, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, then is it not ironic that God would say, I put enmity between thy seed and her seed. You see, that's the seed we're talking about concerning the tares. That his seed, Satan's, would bruise his heel, and he did when they were nailed to the cross. But then that the woman's seed, which is Christ, would bruise his head, because all enemies will be placed under his feet, trampled, by he and his servants. My question is, are you a servant of God? If you have ears to hear, you certainly are. And it's an humbling thing to know that you can unlock that mystery that has been kept secret from the beginning of this world, that is to say, what happened in that garden. Do you have ears to hear? All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment. Won't you please? And um, you have a prayer request? He's your father. He, all you have to do is talk to him. That's what prayer is. He's, he likes to hear you, but mostly he created you for his pleasure. Have you given him any pleasure lately by telling him you love him? It means a lot to him. It makes his day. And when you make his day, I promise you, he will always make yours. Okay, questions from around the country. We're going to Sherry from California. Will the false Christ come in the clouds also to deceive us? He's going to make everything look as near as he can to what prophecy. He, Satan knows God's word, all right? Look, what, look how he tempted Christ. That, that is your example. Look what he said to Christ. He quoted, he used scripture. He just twisted them a little bit. So he's familiar with the scriptures, yes, even the new covenant, as to what it's supposed to appear when he returns. And you, you can rest assured he will fill that bill if you don't have ears to hear. You'll think it's the true Messiah. Okay, Angela from New York. Someone told me I need to go to a blessing lady to have evil spirits removed from me because somebody could have put a curse on me because lately a lot of bad things have been happening to me for no reason. Can people really put a curse on you? 
Is there anything in the Bible about this? It just so happens when we finish this subject, I'm going to cover the witch of Endor. Don't miss it, all right? But so that you have a little bit of rest between now and then, there is nobody can put a curse on you if you're a child of God. I want you to make a note, Luke chapter 10, verse 18, and read the following few verses. Christ gave us power over all our enemies. You don't have to put up with that stuff. Order it in Jesus' name out of your house, out of your mind. It's such a waste of precious time of Christians to um, listen to the voodoo peddlers and so forth, which to a Christian that doesn't exist. Now, you see, evil spirits, you can listen to either good spirits or evil spirits. Now, evil spirits can depress you. They can talk to you, that is to say, in your own mind and cause you to, to deceive yourself. Don't listen to it, all right? Always, in Jesus' name, order it out of your home, out of yourself. Hudson from Wisconsin, who was Cain's wife? You know, I receive that question a great deal, and I suppose the reason being, no one can answer that. That is to say, that is not familiar with the fact that God created all the races on the sixth day. He rested the seventh, and on the eighth day, he created Ha'adam, which is to say the Adam, which is to say to till the soil. The, others, uh, the other races were hunters and fishers. Uh, some lived by the water and some lived in the jungles and so forth. And they spread and migrated. And it was in the land of Nod that Cain took one of the six-day creation for his wife. No one can answer that question unless they are familiar and trust me, there are scholars, there are deep scholars in the Hebrew that know this, but they prefer not to teach it because it comes off racist, they think. All right? I don't feel it's racist at all. Our Father created us that way. And many would say, well, are you saying there is a difference? Well, I, I would think anyone could tell by looking, you know. Are, are you trying to deceive yourself and listen to the mindset of this final generation when they say, you're all exactly alike? We're not. We're not. God created us the way he wanted us. He had a reason for every beautiful race. And the reason you have racism in this generation is because of the mindset that all are one and yet in reality there is a difference and rather than teaching the children to respect with dignity that difference then you have racism rather than teaching each beautiful race and the dignity that it should be afforded they say you're all alike when only an idiot cannot look at the at the say the yellow man and and the and the red complected man and say there's no difference there is a difference there's a difference in many parts of us our eyes and many things that's the way god created us and he said it is good and it is good there's nothing racist about it and it's real sad that the deeper scholars don't have enough backbone to stand up and teach truth. And they go off into wild goose stories of how this race came to be, especially to say that one certain race was created when Noah's son Ham uncovered his father's nakedness, which is to say slept with his wife and gave birth to Canaan. She gave birth to Canaan. An incestuous affair. Your law determining that is Leviticus 18.8. That's an insult to that race. And I, I won't stand for it. The race that they claim was created because of that incestuous affair was created on the sixth day. It was a proud race. And the last chap verse of Genesis chapter 1, God looked at all that he had created and it was good. 
No one is created bad. All right? Well, I don't really, I didn't really didn't mean to get into that much detail about who Cain's wife was, but okay, enough said. Viola from Michigan, would could you explain Genesis 4-1 to me if Adam is not Cain's father? I don't understand. Well, um, you have to have Genesis 4-1 and 4-2, the second verse as well, all right? Because it stipulates. You already found out what happened to Eve in, ver in chapter 3, her conception, all right? Now, then Adam knew her, and she gave birth to twins, not identical twins, because verse 2 in the Hebrew doesn't say again. It says she continued in labor and gave birth to Abel. They were twins, okay? Um, if, if you're not familiar with the fact that uh, uh, paternal twins, not identical, look like their parent, whoever that parent is, and there are many lawsuits over twins born with one even being one race and the other of another. It's, it's not that uncommon. All right, Ron from Oklahoma. What does the number 40 mean? Well, in biblical numerics, it means probation. All right? Like, example, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness 40 years. It's a generation. The generation was put on probation. All right? uh, Christ, um, Christ, when he hungered, in the wilderness, being tested of Satan, tempted, he, he um, fasted 40 days. That's probation. And he came through just great. Okay, Ted from North Carolina. I really enjoy the teaching. Could you tell me what 1 Thessalonians 4.17 means? I need to know how to explain this verse. Well, that, thank you for enjoying the teaching. Ted, in the Greek, there is always a subject and an object, and you've got to back back up to verse 13 to get the subject. The subject being discussed is, if you believe, Paul teaches, that Christ rose from the dead, in other words, he's not in a hole in the ground, then you've got to believe that those that have died in the flesh are with him, meaning they rose also. That's, that's where are the dead is the subject there. And then he continues on saying, We that are alive in the flesh in no way can precede them. Why? Because they rise first instantly when they die. And then he says at the last trump, the seventh trump, there's a great miracle happens that we all change. As it's written in the 15th chapter of Corinthians first, that is, in the twinkle of an eye. And we meet him in the air, and that word air is not sky. In your Strong's Concordance, it is the Greek word 109, air, and it means breath, all right, spiritual body, pneuma, all right? That's what it means. Now, if you want to explain it to somebody, order my tapes on the so-called rapture doctrine, all right? And you'll be well fortified as to what God's Word states on the subject. Rod from California. When a baby dies, does its soul go to heaven or hell? It's innocent. We have a loving, what kind of God do you think we serve? That innocent child, what did Christ say? Bring the little children unto me. Forbid not that the little children come unto me. They're innocent. So naturally they go to heaven instantly. To be absent from this body is present with the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 has to do with the flesh body, the meat. Goes in the ground, it stays there, and it's gone. Dust to dust. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, dust, the flesh goes back to dust, but the spirit, the intellect, or the soul, that beautiful baby's soul, goes instantly to the Father that gave it, okay? To heaven, of course. Uh, Jim from Texas, Hebrews 8.13, indicates to me that the law has been abolished. Please comment. How can you say that, Jim? Hebrews chapter 8 has to do with the new covenant. God says, I'm going to write them a new covenant. 
Do you think that destroyed the old? Of course not. How many times in the New Testament did Jesus teach? Haven't you read? It's written in the Old Covenant. That's our school teacher. And Paul quoted the Old Testament over and over and over again. But if my memory doesn't fail me, you say the 13th verse, if my memory doesn't fail me, the 11th or the 12th verse says, hey, at that time, you see, we go all the way to the millennium after the change into the body. He says, you won't have to ask your neighbor if he knows God's word. Why? He's going to know it. Why will he know it? Because he's in a spiritual body and has full recall. In other words, then when the 13th verse comes along, we're already in the millennium. All right? Jim the law is abolished, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt do no murder. Do you think those are abolished? I mean, you, if you do, you live in a different world than I do. They might as well be as far as the a murderer being dish doled out capital punishment as he should be. And a lot of thieves get away with it. But the law is still very much in effect, okay? Again, Christ said, I don't change one jot of it, one sound of one letter. Uh, Paul. I don't know where Paul is from. Paul, Paul is from Texas. Please address this question. I watch every day. I was sprinkled as an infant for the custom of, okay, uh, for baptism. I'm now 45 and I'm growing closer to Christ's teaching. Should I be rebaptized? Well, you really should be baptized when you make your mind up you want to be, all right? How old was Christ when he was baptized? Was Christ baptized as a child? He was anointed. I mean, on the eighth day he was circumcised, which that's, that's of non-effect anymore. The circumcision is of the heart. But he was baptized when he was 30 years old because... John even tried to, I don't want to say John tried to talk him out of it, but John was hesitant about doing it because he thought Christ should be baptizing him. Now Christ sets our example, and you'll, you'll have to, I have a tape on baptism. If you wish, order it, okay? Mario from Tennessee. Pastor Murray, congratulations. Uh, for what here? Let's see. As far as the comment about Bullinger, I believe you are a scholar. God bless the Shepherd's Chapel. Well, thank you, Mario. He certainly does bless Shepherd's Chapel. Um, Bullinger, if I were to consider myself to be of the caliber of scholar that he was, I would, um, uh, he was an awesome, God really blessed that man in the languages. And uh, yes, I enjoy working with the languages, but I would certainly never place myself. I think that we're all students because when a man ceases being a student and becomes, and, and I, I thank you for the compliment, I'm not putting you down, but I think in a man's own mind, the day he stops being a student and becomes a scholar, uh, he stops learning to a degree. All right. Uh, now that's 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 just that's my own personal opinion. Please don't anyone ask me to document that. But I really consider myself a student because I study every day, seeking deeper truths from our Father's Word. Ah, oh, the awesome depth of our Father's Word. Thank you very much, Mario from Tennessee. I appreciate that.